Good morning, everybody. It's so nice to see you here. Thanks a lot for attending. Um, well, we, all, we, will, we hope that you will enjoy these days, uh, enjoy workshops, presentations, enjoy presenting your own research to others and especially connect to each other because this conference is not just uh, presenting scientific results, it's really about meeting fellow researchers, but especially meeting practitioners. So we have a joint image of what the challenges are. Um, well, not everybody made it in time. That's uh, like it is at conferences, that's okay. I first want to thank all the people who helped in organizing this conference. Uh, our sponsors, Taylor and Francis, scientific publishers, the Botswana Institute of Wildlife Fertility Control, and anonymous donators via uh, crowdfunding. I want to thank uh, all the members of the scientific advisory boards. I want to thank all the people at Wageningen University for helping us out, the people of the scheduling team, uh, our event manager, Mohammed, our caterers, Patrick, Marie-Louise, and special thanks for my co-organizers, Boy van Troffelaar, Mike Manfredo, also Paul Leiden, Emily LeBlanc, and Maria de Witt. And they have been so important. I learned one lesson uh, while organizing this conference. And I'll phrase it as a recommendation, never organize a conference without Emily and Maria. <laughs> um, yes. I want to thank one other person who uh, was not here. And that's Birgit Eilands. Back in 2019, when we planned this conference for 2020, uh, sorry, <laughs> yeah, 2020. Uh, she immediately jumped in. She was a colleague of mine at Wageningen University. Spontaneously, she said, well, she needed a properly 0.101 seconds to think about it. And I said, yes, I will organize this with you. So we started doing this, but then unfortunately, she got ill and she died. Uh, Birgit was a very kind woman, very enthusiastic, uh, full of love for people and nature, and she dedicated her professional career to examining the relationship between people and nature, and I'm sure she would love to be here to listen, to present, and to meet all of you, but unfortunately that's not the case. Uh, I want to thank Brigitte for what she did, for getting this conference started, and just for who she was. Yes, and then life continues, and this conference starts. And I'm very excited to hear the story of Raquel. Raquel is head of rewilding, I think. Most people of you know what rewilding is, NGO. And she has a passion for nature since she was very young. And that passion brought her, well, basically all over the globe, uh, three continents, I guess, um, as a practitioner, uh, active in conservation, as she is now. So I want to give the floor to Raquel. Please go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Um, yeah, as probably you realize, this is not my native environment. <laughs> uh, universities, uh, lectures are not uh, where I uh, grew up and where I have my professional experience. So they're always a little bit intimidating, especially this one with like. <laughs> Uh, twisting your neck up. Uh, but uh, I wanted to start by thanking Martin and the organizers for having 
uh, having rewound in Europe, uh, giving this presentation and giving this opening presentation. I'm here replacing Franz Heppers, he's our managing director. Um, and uh, the reason that he's not here today, uh, he apologizes, but today he's also very busy right now in, in Spain uh, because we are launching our 10th uh, landscape uh, and 10th project uh, across Europe. And this is a big achievement for Liwal in Europe um, uh, after, I think, 10 years to have 10 landscapes where we are committing for the very long term, um, you know, easily 10, 20 years. Um, and so it, it's a huge thing for him and for us. And so he just could not miss that one. Uh, so I hope you can bear with me and I hope I'll be able to do as good as a job as you would do. Um, this week is a week of sharing and uh, we're gonna share a lot of things, um, hopefully lessons, uh, knowledge, but we're also gonna share a lot of energy. And the good thing about opening a, a conference is that we are given the opportunity to set a tone or at least set a stage for what it can be the next three days. And uh, at Rewilding Europe, uh, we have a pretty positive energy. Um, it's, it's part of what rewilding is and we like to uh, wake up thinking positive and continue the days in life and building and working uh, along those lines. So to start the conference, I'm gonna give you a short movie and hopefully uh, that will put us all, uh, if you're not there, that will put us all in a pretty good mood, I hope. And it will go, give you also a bit of a feel of uh, what rewilding Europe is about. Uh, all right. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, I don't do myself a favor by putting this view up front because <laughs> whatever I say now, it's not gonna. It's gonna be very pale compared to that. But I hope that this touched a little bit of your hearts um, and 
brings out the emotion that we need to connect nature and make a change in our natural environment. And the rest of my presentation will be about trying to connect with the more the rational side of uh, who we are as people. Uh, but pretty much the message will be very much what is there in, in this video, uh, that there's a, a, a reason for hope and there's ways that we can bring back and embrace wildlife in our lives. The results, the presentation is centered around the study that we did uh, in the last two years. Uh, we called it uh, Wildlife Comeback in Europe, Opportunities and Challenges for Species Recovery. This is a study that we did for the first time in 2013 um, and where we got a pulse for how was uh, wildlife coming back uh, in Europe. Certain species, not, not everything of course, but looking at species that are just starting to show signs of recovery, how are those coming back? And now after, or almost, after 10 years, now, almost 10 years, we decided let's do it again. Let's see again uh, where we are with these species. Um, and so the presentation will focus on that. And again, it's focusing on the, on the positive uh, news that wildlife come back also brings. Uh, I know a lot of the discourse, we all know that, a lot of the discourse in conservation centers around, you know, challenges and the barriers and the threats and, and all the difficulties that are out there, and they are there. Uh, we're not saying to ignore those, but there's also good news and there's a lot to learn also with, with the good news that are coming out. Um, so very, very quickly, the, 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 today I'm going to speak about what are the results in terms of the species distributions and range changes for these species, a uh, little bit on the drivers and the challenges that, that we face, uh, also about what, what are we seeing in terms of interaction with people, I'm sure that a lot of the, the audience will be much more suitable to talk about this topic. Um, and last but not least, I'm going to give you just a little bit of a flavor of what we are doing uh, in uh, rewilding Europe in what regards wildlife comeback. So as I was saying, the, the study that we did focused on, first of all, we picked the, the species that we analyzed in 2013, 37 species, and we increased that number up to 50 by adding another six species of mammals and six species of birds. And for the first time, we are looking at uh, uh, the recovery of reptile species as well uh, with the loggerhead turtle. Lots of data was used to, to do this study uh, and lots of people were involved uh, either directly or uh, are in, in, in being consulted um, in, the, in the analysis of, of each one of the species. The key things and the key types of results that we looked at is distribution and changes in the range of, of distribution and the population size, uh, population size of the species. Uh, and as I said, a little bit on threats and uh, what type of conservation actions are making a, a difference. Uh, in terms of mammal, 25 mammal species were looked at, 24, I'm sorry, uh, with one reptile. Uh, these species represent a broad spectrum across uh, the continent, uh, both in terms of habitats, uh, both uh, in terms of geographic distribution in the continent, but also in terms of the type of species of body mass uh, and the type of yield that they occupy in, in the ecosystem. So it even includes the marine side uh, with humpback whales. Same thing of thinking has gone into selecting the bird species. Again, a quite varied uh, group of species uh, looking at the distribution across Europe and as well as, as gills. The way that the report and the information is structured, and again, you can, you can download all this uh, in the internet uh, from our website. It's a free document, about, I think, two or 300 pages. Can't remember now, uh, but you can download it and, and for yourselves and so for students, whoever needs it. Um, freely accessible. And each, each species, what we did was to do a, a bit of a species account uh, where we tried to synthesize a lot of information for that particular species. And the, the, the report is very rich on graphics uh, and very rich on you know, infographics and maps and icons to try to make all this massive amount of information digestible and accessible for a wider group of people. It's not a scientific document. But uh, to my, it is my understanding quite a few uh, manuscripts are coming out of it um, that uh, the scientists will now take over um, 
and published. So looking at the results, um, so two, two main indicators that we looked at, as I mentioned, population change. The first thing that we've noticed when it comes to population changes in mammals is that, yes, many of these species continue to recover. Uh, so they started this path of recovery, many of them, many, many years ago, uh, some of them in the early, in the early uh, 20th century, like the European bison. Uh, others have started more recent uh, paths of recovery, but overall they continue to recover some more than others. Uh, some species are really showing big changes in population, uh, population sizes. These are relative abundances, remember, uh, that uh, it's important to keep in mind that we, we starting from a very, very low level of population uh, sizes. Uh, so these are not actual number of species, number of animals. This is relative abundance. So it compares to uh, the population size at the beginning. And so all these, even though they are all recovering to a certain extent, uh, they are all still very fragile. Um, and so, uh, yes, they are going in the right direction, but it's like, like these big stairs, you know, we climb the first step. There's, there's still a long, uh, uh, many, many steps to take. But bison for sure and beavers are incredible examples of recovery. Um, others, not so much. Uh, they haven't really increased in the last, uh, since, since the time that the, the data was started to be analyzed, like pine martens and, and the elk um, in North America. The same thing can be said for uh, bird species that were analyzed. Uh, the biggest uh, increase that we have seen and witnessed is the barnacle goose, uh, as you can see. Uh, big, big increase since, since the time that uh, the data was analyzed, but also, also among the raptors. Um, some of them are uh, showing quite good signs of recovery. Um, imperial, uh, spent imperial eel and others. Um, Looking now at the range, and the range by this we mean the distribution of, of the species across the continent. Uh, overall, they are increasing, and so many of these species are expanding uh, their range. Um, again, the beavers and bison continue to be examples that they are not just increasing in numbers, but they are expanding in range, while others are not expanding. And this is something that uh, we now can, can look back and compare that um, there was a time that they were increasing and now the, some of these populations are actually stabilizing or even declining, uh, which is uh, the case, well, in terms of range, which is the case of the European otter. Keep in mind that just because the distribution is not expanding, it doesn't mean that the population size is not necessarily expanding. It can be expanding, but in terms of how wide they are distributed, they seem to be hitting a, a wall and not uh, expanding from there. But what we see is that um, with the birds, for example, uh, some of the species of birds that are not expanding uh, their range, they are actually quite well protected and the population itself uh, is increasing, the numbers is increasing, but they are not expanding their, their distribution because they are facing barriers of expansion. In terms of the birds, uh, most of the species have displayed an increase in the distribution uh, across the continent. 19 species, I think, of all these, uh, with really quite big changes on, on, on barnacle goose again. Um, but also, you know, if you look at the geographic distribution and the areas where we saw the most changes is that um, we saw a decline of the distribution of species in Southern Europe and Eastern Europe more than we saw uh, in Northern Europe. This is all uh, done, a lot, lot of this analysis done on literature review, of course, and expert uh, assessments. But what we have noticed is that the monitoring data that is being collected across Europe is very uneven. Um, and I cannot say this enough, I feel it myself uh, when working with our teams. Uh, the the tax, taxonomic groups that are being uh, studied and the distribution of the species or the type of species that are getting uh, studied, it's, it's very, very uneven. And so it's really difficult to build a picture of wildlife recovery in Europe because of that. So for all the scientists out there, uh, keep this in mind, please. Um, citizen science, um, it's 
proving to make a difference uh, as well as the use of technology uh, we think the more we involve people and the more we can look at the data that they are collecting and find ways of making that data significant uh, by the use of technology i think we will see be seeing in the next 10 years big big changes in the amount of data and, and the quality of data that is available thanks to all the great people that are out there and they're interested in wildlife but one thing that is not there also uh, is an understanding of what is the impact of wildlife comeback uh, in the ecosystems. And this is really, really important because wildlife comeback or wildlife in general, I think it's getting a, a, second, a second stage type of attention when it comes to the big uh, environmental agendas uh, at, the, at the global level. Uh, and I'm here referring to, to the carbon agenda. Uh, and so to be able to link biodiversity crisis with uh, uh, the climate crisis and carbon and all that, we need a lot more uh, proof that uh, wildlife can bring and has an impact on, uh, on these agendas as well, on ecosystem function, sorry. Uh, we also studied uh, some of the, what, what, is, what are the drivers of recovery are the limits for the growth of these species? These are recovering species, but even them are facing threats. So we want to understand how big of the threats these are and are they still really affected by, by threats? Uh, but also, um, if they are uh, threatened, uh, do they are they sensitive to that? Are they recovering less quickly? And what are what is the conservation measures uh, having an impact or not um, in in this in this species? Again, summarizing all this data has has not been, been easy, but uh, the scientists managed to bring it all together in two big blocks of information. Uh, one of them focuses on uh, uh, the reasons of recovery, uh, and here looking at the mammals uh, as, as an example, um, what we have found out is that mammal species overall they are expanding their range uh, naturally uh, by natural recolonization. Uh, in other words, if we give them the space, they uh, take care of themselves and they find a way. I mean, we all know the wolf here in the Netherlands is a very good example of that. Um, but, uh, and we see that happening with many other species. Um, so they find a way somehow in I mean, the millions of people that are out there, they find a way to expand their range and expand their numbers. On the other hand, reintroductions and translocations, so active actions, active work from conservationists across uh, the continent, that is making a difference. Uh, so kudos to that. Um, so, and that has to continue, uh, we think. Um, it should not be underestimated the amount of success that, that exists and how much these species still depend, depend on that. On the other hand, uh, pressures and threats, of course, that exploitation, and here we talk about hunting, uh, partly, of mammal species are still an issue, whether it's legal or illegal, um, uh, exploitation of some of these species <coughs> are still uh, a big threat uh, for their numbers, unfortunately. Habitat degradation as well, of course, but you know that. Um, yeah, well, this slide talks a little bit of the same, it's a repeat, it's just a different way of presenting the information, but um, yeah, well, I don't need to go over that. Um, when it comes to birds, the situation is very different from mammals, it's not as straightforward, maybe because birds have uh, different, uh, very different life cycles and uh, migrations and use of habitat and all that. But what happens uh, with birds is, not, is that we saw a whole much wider variety of conservation measures being applied um, to, this, to this group of species. But above all those, the ones that are really uh, seem to be making a big difference is the legal protection that is put on the species. Uh, when it's, uh, you know, stipulating is as a no hunting species or forbidding the collection of eggs uh, or stopping, uh, yeah, stopping disturbances of, of nesting areas, whatever those are, those are making a difference uh, across uh, this group of species that we saw. And of course, that similar to mammals, uh, protection of uh, habitat uh, is also making a, a big difference. On the other hand, these are species that are very, very uh, sensitive to agriculture and aquaculture. So the use of, of land that uh, in these two big sectors, 
uh, but also uh, transport corridors, uh, infrastructure development, uh, sometimes from close friends of, of renewable energy, uh, we all know, uh, they have impact uh, on these pieces. And um, yeah, that's something that uh, we can need to continue <coughs> to deal with and manage for um, because they are not going to go away. Uh, yeah, well, I don't need to go over that. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit now about as well one thing that we also looked in the in the in the study was the interaction with people and how is the outlook of uh, the coexistence of wildlife and uh, Europeans uh, across the continent um, and throughout mammals or uh, birds what we are finding out is that overall there are both challenges opportunities of course but but we are seeing more and more proximity with wildlife, uh, of course, uh, and that brings risks, but also uh, that have to do with disease. Uh, we all know this is just one example. Uh, probably COVID is probably a good example of this type of risks. I'm not saying that it's going to happen in Europe. It can happen. Um, but yeah, that, there's an example of a risk that is very clear. Um, but also as well as all that we can see the wildlife damage and what we can see the damage and when it is damaged and how we deal with this damage. Um, you know, I find that for a European, I am European, but I lived most of my life outside of Europe, uh, adult life, especially in Africa. Uh, what we as Europeans consider damage is quite shocking um, uh, compared with other countries and other cultures and uh, life, lifestyles. Um, but it is a reality in Europe, uh, and this is a big issue um, um, in the continent. But at the same time, there are big opportunities, as you all know. Um, Socioeconomic, they, they are quite varied. Ecotourism is an obvious one, but let's not stop there. Uh, ecotourism is good for some species and brings benefits to very specific pockets of, of the society across the continent, but it's not a, a silver bullet uh, to be able to motivate people to bring back wildlife uh, because it does not put money in the number of money in pockets, enough pockets across the continent to be able to be the only force, uh, a positive force. So we have to be far more creative on uh, how to uh, increase the number of socioeconomic benefits um, to, to use it as a, as a stimulant for wildlife comeback. Um, of course, that the opportunities of recovering uh, wildlife for the sake of ecosystem processes and functioning ecosystem processes and ecosystems that that brings for us as people are uh, clear, um, but that again is not well captured in our um, economic systems uh, in my view. Just a quick look on the large carnivore come back. There are five, li five large carnivores in Europe. Um, Brown bear, gray wolf, wolverine, etc. Um, they are all recovering, so that is great news. Uh, but there are big challenges, uh, and, and this is something that uh, probably we can find in other continents, not just in Europe. Public perception, above all, probably is one of the big uh, problems of the or challenges that we need to deal with to bring back these animals and financial losses. Um, and that's why communities, they need to be at the center of any type of work that we do when we come to, to recover these species. Uh, they are the reason why they come back and they are the reasons of their, uh, let's say, disappearance or decline if it happens. So they are the solution for any issues and challenges that may arise. So they have to be at the center of any initiative that is done. Um, and to us at three at uh, rural in Europe, uh, that is very important. All the work that we do has the communities at their center, and any uh, species that we work with that requires active coexistence management, uh, that's a big agenda. And we're trying really to push the teams uh, in the on the ground to focus on that. Um, yeah, so these species in themselves, by their ecological nature uh, in, the, in the ecosystem, they can bring a lot of uh, cascading effects across the ecosystem. So, yeah, we're hoping that uh, their, their recovery in terms of numbers and in terms of distribution, we will start seeing some of those uh, cascading effects. It's still early for that, though, some places. 
Um, the study also looked a little bit of how are these species dealt uh, in the climate change agenda. And there is an understanding, of course, that uh, the recovery of wildlife uh, species across continents can have an impact on climate, but this is not uh, still researched enough. There's far more studies that need to go into this type of connection um, because uh, until now, the carbon cycle, it's been very, very focused on uh, vegetation and forest, and, 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 uh, but not taking into account all the wildlife side of the carbon cycle. And of course, that uh, species are also part of that carbon uh, cycle, and uh, by their behavior, they can have an effect and an impact on this. But this is completely underestimated and understudied. And so, uh, researchers, please focus on that. Uh, we'd love to have your support there um, uh, because we need to prove these linkages. In sum, um, as you can see, we are these pieces, these great examples of, of some of these recoveries are uh, very good. They are coming back slowly. Uh, they are coming back and they are expanding slowly. Uh, they're in the right trajectory, but remember they are starting very, very low numbers. Uh, but if we continue like this, it will be very good. But we have also seen some initial signs of some of these species really you know, going back and not recovering as much as they were recovering a few years ago, and some even declining. Um, so yeah, there are threats and there are challenges that we need to, to keep pushing on and keep working on uh, to keep uh, giving them the space that they need uh, to, to recover. They don't need to be managed, uh, people <coughs> need to be managed and they'll take care of the rest. Wildlife comeback does contribute to ecosystem restoration, we all know that, but in order to do that, we need to monitor more, we need to monitor across taxonomic ranges, uh, groups, uh, and we need to make the connections between uh, the function of these ecosystems and the wildlife and bring it to the policy makers and the ones that are pushing and dealing uh, with uh, the carbon and climate agenda and bringing it into their language and into their agenda. Uh, uh, because whether we, we like it or not, um, climate is the big uh, agenda, uh, policy maker internationally uh, that, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just moving mountains and that connection is there and needs to be highlighted. Yeah, I mean, I think the, I just said this, uh, legal and policy frameworks are there and they, they are great opportunities. And now just to summarize, I'm gonna just speak very briefly about what we do at Free Wild in Europe uh, when it comes to wildlife and bag. This part can in itself be a whole uh, presentation. I'm not going to do that. So I'm just going to show a, a couple of slides just to show you where we work and how when it comes to wildlife. Um, we are now working in 10 landscapes. Uh, Iberian Highlands is being launched uh, today um, as we speak right now. If you open the Guardian, there is a news there. Um, hopefully it's front page, I'm not sure, <laughs> but it is there. Um, and the way that we work is that we build and we commit to demonstration sites. We call them the demonstration landscapes and we want to, to demonstrate that rewilding is possible and brings benefits. We commit to these landscapes for a very, very long time. Uh, the oldest one right now is 10 years, and uh, we are not thinking to come out any anytime soon. So easily 10 to 10, I don't know, 20, 30 years, whatever it takes to bring these uh, landscapes back. And that's why this 10 this year is so important. We want to aim by 2030, we want to reach uh, 15 landscapes the focus will now include marine as well. So we are starting to scope the lens, uh, the continent and uh, uh, to see where, where it makes sense to play a role in the marine environment because it is a pretty busy area, uh, busy environment, and there has to be a value added for our involvement. Otherwise, there's plenty to do on land um, uh, for us to go there. Each of the landscapes on land is about 100,000 hectares, but they are embedded in a much wider uh, landscape in their own countries, and they're all uh, locally anchored. They all have uh, local uh, entities, 
and they will have local boards and we work with them close in close the association where basically we all commit to one agenda one mission across the continent and the results and the successes are and failures are shared uh, throughout uh, all of them are working in wildlife come back uh, you, you know it, it varies a lot depending on, on the current situation on the local situation uh, in the case of Italy, in the central Apennines, we are working very closely with uh, Mark and Brown Bear. Uh, in the case of Portugal, on the other hand, we are working with uh, several species of horses um, and, and also Taurus, um, also in the Iberian, uh, Iberian Highlands. Um, but yeah, I mean, it varies. Southern Carpathians. Uh, I think we have, we are now, uh, we are introducing the, the bison as a mega herbivore. There's now a population of about 120 animals free roaming. Uh, they can go anywhere. Um, and we keep expanding that population. It's not big enough. Um, and we, we need to, to keep going uh, for quite some time. Rodopi Mountains, a lot of work on scenarios vultures and griffin vultures. So the whole cycle of life a type of approach, uh, very, very strong work there. Um, and so, yeah, I can keep going, but lots of examples on why I've come back. Um, all this work done locally by the local entities, rewilding entities with local partners um, everywhere. Uh, this is not done by rewilding Europe alone. Don't think that. It's always done with, with partners. These are some of our symbols, just so you so just so you see that wildlife come back is a big thing in our agenda and will continue to be. Uh, we feel that uh, well, they are important, you know, technically uh, important for the ecosystem, but they are also great avenues to reach people's hearts and pe reach people's emotions, which is what we need uh, to really uh, start stimulating a change. Um, if we don't uh, awaken their hearts, it will be difficult to uh, change anything based on rationality alone. Um, and so we are focusing on more than 30 species right now. They are mostly keystone species. Uh, our emphasis is not so much on rarity or status of conservation of a specific species. That is not a driving um, action for us. What matters for the most part is the role that the species plays in the ecosystem. And so we tend to focus on, on keystone species. Not always, but uh, it's, it's a big focus of the organization. And there are two big ways of going about it. One, either active reintroductions or just creating the conditions for them to come back. Uh, some of them are coming back. So in the case of Boulder Delta, right now we're not uh, stimulating or starting any reintroductions, uh, but we are seeing and we are seeing the distribution of where the, some of the key species are moving. And we, we see that, okay, if you give it a, a couple of years, a few more years, they will get to the right places and then start coming back to the, pot, to the landscape. So it's all about creating the enabling conditions for, for them to actually come back by themselves. <laughs> um, so we are, and, and in line of this, when it comes to reintroductions, in line of this, we launched recently the Wildlife Comeback Fund. I will just talk briefly about that. Uh, it was launched last month. And this is just a quick graph to show you uh, the, the, the types of species that we work throughout. These are our landscapes at the top, so 10 landscapes. And this just shows a little bit the variety of all the species that we are either working directly, reintroductions in this case, or uh, working with partners uh, or working on the habitat and the enabling conditions, legal, whatever they are. Uh, for them to come back. So in that case, for instance, in the case of Portugal, we're working on uh, the comeback of the wolf, uh, uh, but not on reintroductions, but working a lot with farmers, working, working with uh, guard dogs, uh, and trying to reduce the amount of conflict with wolf for them to come back. Um, that's just one example. And the case of the Southern Carpathians, active reintroduction of bison uh, happening there. And with this in mind, I'm going to finish just to present by presenting the Wildlife uh, Comeback Fund. This is a fund, fund uh, money fund, <laughs> I don't know how to say it. Um, this is a fund that we launched in September last, uh, well, September uh, last month. And it is focused on uh, providing funding uh, for the reintroduction of keystone species or the reinforcement of populations of keystone species. 
But our focus and, and the emphasis is there already is to find initiatives that are ready uh, to, uh, to be implemented on the ground. So this fund is not focusing on financing uh, the preparatory phase uh, for, for introduction. So feasibility studies, consulting with stakeholders, all that, we're expecting all that to be done and the fund will provide the support once all the preparatory fund, uh, preparatory work is done, we'll come in after that and uh, provide that funding. This is something that we've seen uh, is missing in the, the funding uh, portfolio or funding organizations out there. Most of them provide funding both for preparatory and ends and reintroductions, but many of them stop. So population reinforcements, sometimes the, the reinforcements do not happen and initial uh, efforts have to stop and uh, the full potential of that particular exercise doesn't uh, take hold. Um, and so with this fund, what we are hoping to do is to strengthen existing, uh, existing efforts and increase the, the number of reintroductions and uh, animals uh, on the landscapes as soon as possible uh, across Europe. And we're trying to do it in a flexible way, a proactive way. So it's not, we're not calling for proposals. Uh, anyone that is interested or thinks that their initiative uh, fits, uh, you're super welcome to contact me, contact uh, Rewild in Europe via our website, and uh, let's talk about it um, because we're not going to go out and, and call for proposals on that. Um, but we will also invite uh, initiatives that we are aware of. Uh, that we think would fit and would benefit from this type of funding. The point of this fund is also to connect what we call the demand and supply uh, in the case to avoid situations of culling. Uh, and this is particularly important for rare species. We have come across many situations where, not many, but a few situations where species have to, or animals have to be culled because they have reached some type of carrying capacity where they are. And so the local managers don't have the conditions to keep them. Uh, they don't have the money uh, to connect and, and take them elsewhere and vice versa. The receiving ends, uh, uh, many times they don't have the money to bring animals that they need. And so we are hoping that this type of funding will create the conditions for avoiding culling and avoiding uh, uh, loss of animals. And I think that is it. Yeah, I mean, just to say that this fund was put in place thanks to the support of our Fund funds and the uh, Delina Foundation. Uh, this is just uh, the beginning. Uh, the fund now is about 1.5 million euros, but we want to grow it uh, at least to 5 million. So if you know donors out there, if you know partners, uh, we invite you to join us um, and uh, yeah, uh, just create the conditions for to have more wildlife uh, across across our landscapes in Europe. And let's welcome it. So thank you. Good. I hope there's time for questions. Um, that will be. I got a sign there. Yeah, I'll be here. Yes. Hi. Can everyone hear me? Um, I'm sorry to be loud. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you so much for that uh, presentation. I am I'm very inspired, and I just want to know some of the key knowledge gaps you were uh, providing us. So thank you for that. Um, you had just mentioned kind of this hacking uh, in the talk about we need to manage people uh, and let the wildlife do, mm -hmm. do what they can. Um, but in the in the knowledge gaps, I didn't see a particular call for monitoring visitors and monitoring like the changing experience of local communities in which these wild free wild and free landscapes are being. And I'm curious if you can talk to how you have perhaps uh, rewild in Europe. Consider the import, um, consider the role of understanding um, local monitoring, local perception, monitoring the types of visitors and the impact uh, that uh, perhaps nature based tourism can bring to landscapes, sharing landscapes, uh, in the long term longevity of these through wild landscapes. 
Yeah. And I was, uh, it just came to me actually when you were talking about um, talking to the patient that uh, perhaps there should also be a focus on rewilding human community mm -hmm. um, <laughs> in terms of reconnecting us to a sense of sharing the future with the world, mm -hmm. sharing, sharing uh, the future with non patients. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for your question. It's a good question and uh, it's not an easy one. I am a biologist by training and uh, so I work mostly with people, uh, all of us, of course. Um, the, so just, just to be clear, the landscapes that I'm referring here, uh, they are not um, uh, protected areas, legal protected areas where there are visitors, uh, where you pay a ticket and you, you go into the landscape. Uh, there, these are uh, uh, areas of countries where we focus our action, but of course they have visitors, yeah. Uh, um, so for us, rewilding is not possible without people, and if we want to rewild nature, we do have to rewild people in a way, <laughs> and bring that sense of sharing uh, and sharing. Um, to me personally, I think the sharing part is the most difficult for people. Um, we lost our, we are losing, we lost, or we are losing our ability to share, uh, uh, not just with wildlife, I think, uh, but uh, in many parts of our society, I think we are losing that that ability to share time and, and share time, share space, share emotions. <laughs> um, so for us, people is at the center. Uh, some of our landscapes and some of our teams are focusing on understanding the perception of uh, not just visitors, but more importantly, the local uh, people that are living in these landscapes, what is their current attitude towards this uh, wildlife and what is, what is it that they need? Uh, what, is, what, is, uh, what is that they need on a personal level, uh, regardless of wildlife? But what is the, the, the key thing that they need and what does wildlife and nature play? What role does it play there? So it's a big part of our agenda. In our monitoring uh, framework for the next 10 years, we have something called uh, Attitude Index, where uh, it's actually a method that we haven't developed. Uh, we looking forward to develop that method on understanding the attitude of people towards rewilding. Um, and so people are a central part for, for our work, not just in terms of outreach engagement, but bringing you know, the very hardcore financial benefits and all that. So that is needed, uh, but it's not the only thing. We want communities that feel proud of their uh, landscapes and, uh, and they feel a sense of belonging, a sense of identity. Those are as important as all the very rational things, socioeconomic uh, measures and services that we have. And we're hoping that through the development of this attitude index, we'll be able to tap into these very uh, non-quantitative, uh, well, I'm sorry, for those social scientists out there, uh, these are intangible um, you know, dimensions of pride and identity uh, that is so important. Yeah. Uh, looking at the floor, I think it's time to uh, end this session. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.